You're listening to Gender, A Wider Lens. I'm Stella O'Malley, a psychotherapist in Ireland. And I'm Sasha Ayad, an adolescent therapist in the United States. Since 2016, my practice has been exclusively dedicated to gender questioning teens and families impacted by gender dysphoria. I also work with gender questioning teenagers and I facilitate at support meetings for families and individuals who have been impacted by gender issues. We're curious about the concept of gender and how it's unfolding in the wider culture. Join us as we look at gender through a wider lens. Claire Graham is a qualified teacher with over 20 years experience who works as an advocate for people with DSDs or differences of sexual development, at the UK charity called DSD Families. Claire has been writing about her experience of growing up with a DSD, and she tackles misconceptions about what intersex conditions are and what they are not. She strongly believes in the importance of evidence-based healthcare and policy, and thinks that people should have access to quality information about their bodies so they can make informed decisions. She's also written extensively on the issues of sex, gender identity, academic freedom, and free speech. Here is our conversation with Claire. Hi there. So today we have with us Claire Graham. Welcome to the show, Claire. Hi, thank you for having me on. I'm very excited to have you on, Claire. I've been uh, friends with you for some time now, but certainly when I first started following you on Twitter, uh, it it was just so enlightening to hear somebody talk and finally give some facts around this. And so I'm really, I'm really hoping that this hour in this podcast will really illuminate the whole, the whole condition that is often known as DSD and intersex. So you can take it away, Claire, Mm -hmm. and tell us. Mm -hmm. Um, So shall I just start with a basic explanation for what yeah. what it is sure so yeah. DSDs are I'll use DSD some people prefer intersex but most people prefer uh, specific um, con- like condition specific terminology so DSD is an umbrella term for around 40 plus medical conditions that affect the development of sex characteristics so mainly the reproductive tract but it could also mean during puberty like if you're a male you might grow some breast tissue or something along those lines. Is that succinct enough? <laughs> yeah, and and maybe um, I know that I've heard about case, and then you have something abbreviated MHRK. Is that correct? MRKH. Yeah. MRKH. Can you tell us a little bit about maybe some specific uh, differences of sexual development? Yeah. So, okay. So MRKH is someone like myself. So I have XX chromosomes, which are typical for a female. I have ovaries, um, but my internal reproductive organs didn't grow or didn't develop fully so I have a tiny uterus um, I have no cervix and I have a what they call a short vagina. Case is a girl with XY chromosomes so not typical for a girl. Um, They can't respond to androgens testosterone so their phenotype their external body looks female. Um, Like me they wouldn't have um, a cervix or a uterus and their vagina would be short because those don't develop fully. Um, and can I ask, are they, you know, they often get kind of mentioned, MRKH and CASE, C-A-I-S, I think. Are they the most common among women or, or what is it? Um, I think possibly so. Um, MRKH occurs in around one in 5,000 women. So like when, like using the word common in like intersex or DSD terms, it's like it's never going to be <laughs> common. Um, CASE, I can't remember, that's slightly rarer. Um, but I think they're the most just the most well known. There's also Turner syndrome where women are born without and with only one X chromosome. So they would tend to have like their ovaries would be underdeveloped and then along with the rest of their reproductive organs could be underdeveloped as well. Mm-hmm. And what about some um, intersex conditions that occur in male people? So there's probably the most well known is Kleinfelters, which would be a guy with XXY chromosomes. They look typical at birth. Um, during puberty, you might see, again, there might be like some breast development or they might not develop as masculine, I suppose, is one way to put it. Um, then like case is part of a, like a spectrum of conditions. So there's also PACE, P-A-I-S. 
um, which is partial androgen sensitivity as opposed to case which is complete. So mm. some mm -hmm. people with PACE would be female at birth and some would be male at birth, depending on how their genitalia developed. Okay, okay. So how are these types of conditions typically uh, discovered or diagnosed? My understanding is that some are not even obvious or apparent until puberty. So can you tell us a little bit about how these conditions get diagnosed? Yeah, sure. So some are a visible difference at birth. So if a child is born with genitals that look different to what we would expect, that would obviously be a red flag. Um, like mine wasn't discovered at all because I look typical on the outside. So mine wasn't discovered until puberty because I didn't get my period. So obviously that was an indicator that something was different and then it was investigated. That's quite common for a lot of the DSDs that girls have. That's a common way they would they would find out. Sometimes people might not find out until they're adults if they're trying to conceive and there's fertility issues and then that might be when, when they find out. So could somebody conceivably have a DSD? Or do you say have a DSD? Is that the phraseology yeah, yeah, yeah. in this world where our linguistics are so important? <laughs> um, if somebody ha Could somebody have a DSD and be, you know, 56 and not know? You could be, yeah. Um, I've seen Emma Hilton talk about this. And as she said, it's it, because you could go your whole life and not know. But then kind of in what meaningful way have you got a DSD? Mm. But if it's not impacting on your life, then... Does it matter that you, that you don't know that you have like maybe an extra X chromosome or, you know, it it would be that kind of thing. Could it be, let's say, somebody who, who's struggling to conceive and then they find out that they have a True. DSD? Is that a common? Um, that's I think that's more common in males. So like there's XX male syndrome where guys are born with two X chromosomes instead of the X and the Y. And I think a lot of guys with that don't find out until later in life when there's fertility issues. Mm. So when it comes to DSDs, one question that's popping up for me is um, if the, if somebody, let's say the males with XX, right? If if they are males, what what medical or biological criteria is used to say that's a male person rather than saying, well, that's a female person with a male looking body, right? So how do doctors and hmm. scientists determine? Because it's not only genetics, obviously, there's something else. So most of the time with DSDs, it's just the same as with everyone else. They just look at the genitals at birth and then that's the sex that you are recorded as. Um, if it's more complicated, so if someone's born with what's termed sometimes ambiguous genitalia, um, then they would look at chromosomes, hormones, internal body parts, and so because they would want to get a, a bigger picture of the person as they grow as well. So mm -hmm. what, what potentially could happen during puberty? So what hormones might they produce without any intervention and what effect will that have so it's like a, a, a much bigger picture than any one factor when it's a more complex case and could i ask is it always definitive is there always a, a, an answer this is male with dsd this is female is there ever a kind of well actually we can't tell well every child in the uk and every child in the us is given a male or female designation. Um, sometimes it's going to be very complicated to get to the answer, but they always do get to an answer. And that's, most intersex orgs prefer that because obviously you would be, it, where it's so difficult to find out, that would be very rare. So if we were marking these children as X, as opposed to F or M, that would be automatically outed then as having their DSD for the rest of their life. So the, the sort of the preferred way of doing it is that every child will, will have an M or F, will be male and, or female. Um, could you tell me a little bit about the history? Because as far as I know, like really in the 1950s and 60s, science hadn't caught up. So some children were being kind of misassigned, for want of a better word, or given the wrong sex. Is that right? And now science is pretty much caught up, but it's pretty accurate now there was a, I think in the past part of the problem was that there was a belief that someone couldn't um so for example if a boy was born with a very small penis that he would make this isn't what I think this is what they thought in the past that he would make an inadequate man and therefore this is where the surgeries came from then so what they would do is they would remove the penis and 
create a vagina instead and raise the child as female. So it wasn't that they were like guessing wrong or working it out wrong. They were trying to surgically enforce a different sex. And that's where a lot of the people who it got it wrong, that's where that comes from. And so I, my understanding is that in advocacy work around DSDs, this has been a major point of discussion that advocates are trying to reduce the amount of kind of cosmetic style surgeries that are performed on kids with these conditions. Can you talk like a little bit more about that? Yeah. Um, so as I say, some of the surgeries at the extreme end would be changing the sex of the child completely. Also, um, some of the surgeries were, you, so there's a condition called CAH, which both boys and girls can have CAH, but it only presents as a DSD in girls because it's um, about excess testosterone. So what happens in the uterus with a girl with CAH is that her body will virilize. It will begin to look more masculine because of the testosterone. So she'll be sometimes they'll be born with a large clitoris and the labia might be fused. And what would happen is the clitoris would be surgically reduced or sometimes removed completely and the labia opened up to yeah, it's horrific. It would be Oh my god. Up. It's I mean it's I mean it's, that's like FGM yeah, but it's, for a different cultural reason. This which again is why they did some research. I was reading this um a couple of weeks ago where they um, they sort of gave the scenario to people and they described a girl who was born virilized. If they said the girl was female, everyone was against the cutting because they all recognized it as FGM. If they said the girl mm-hmm. was intersex, then they would be more likely to support the idea of surgery because it's, oh. you know, maybe it's something wrong and we should fix it, is the way that people mm. would see it. Mm. What do you think of the uh, argument? Because, like, when I was thinking about this interview, I kept going back and forth in my mind of like, well, I can see this point. Oh, but I can see this other point. So I think this is very complicated. And as someone who's never experienced a DSD myself, like, of course, I'm an outsider. But what do you make of the argument that some might make to say, if we create a body that looks more typical for this child, they will have an easier time finding a partner, having relationships. I mean, what do you say to that argument? Because I, I could be persuaded either way. I don't know. Yeah, I think that's really difficult. And it's, um, and I think it's because it's not just in with DSDs, with anyone born with a visible disability. It's a question that's asked, isn't it? Um, I think the, the, what most advocates would say is that it could, if it can be delayed until the child can make their own decision, because let's so let's if we assume everyone is going to have like penetrative sex and do surgery that way, that might not be true for everyone. So it might not matter to some people that their genitals are different anyway. So I think the older someone is, so they can make that decision themselves once they know their own body and their own sexuality. It's it's got to be better, I think, because there's so many risks in cutting into someone's genitals that. Ideally, if you can avoid it, that would be better. And it kind of raises that question of consent, which obviously comes up in trans children debates, because can a baby obviously not consent to having their genitals changed? And, you know, you'd even I would even say, like, can a 13 year old make that decision? I don't know. I think it's complicated, but I, I could understand how someone with an intersex condition by the time they've gone through puberty, you know, might have a general sense of like, where they want to be or what role they want to live in. Yeah, I I have a friend who has a child who is a boy with a DSD and he has um, hyperspadia, so where the urethra opens on the underside of the penis. Mm. And that's kind of been fine to a point, but he's now at an age where he start noticing his friends can all pee standing up and he wants to be just, he's got a big brother and he wants to be just like his mm. brother. And I think, you know, that's when you can start having those conversations once they themselves notice I'm different and I would like this to be less different. Are these types of surgeries, uh, are they pretty safe? I mean, like, for example, again, I don't know much about intersex conditions, but I do know that something like a phalloplasty, which is a totally different situation, it's literally changing one type of organ to another, is very complicated and risky. But for a surgery like the one that you you mentioned about your friend's son, are those pretty safe? I mean, are doctors pretty familiar with those types of procedures to perform them safely? Hyperspadia surgeries are actually quite common. Um, Boys born with hyperspadia is common. It's not always classed as a DSD, it can be sign of a DSD. 
Um, so they, I think the um, surgical techniques have improved. I don't think they've always been great, but they have improved. Um, it's one of the difficulties in, with intersex activism is that they rely on stories from the past and they talk about it as though they're happening now. So you will find older people who had the surgeries that where it wasn't successful or where it did damage and they wish that hadn't happened. But that doesn't mean that all the surgeries now would have the same kind of outcomes. And what what is the, the community? Is it is it a community in conflict? Yes, I would say so. And on all subjects, there's... Um, and like with the surgeries, you will find people who were glad they had surgeries when they were babies. You know, it's... Uh, so there's very little consensus. Yeah. Okay. How would you know? I know you said there's about one in 5,000 might have an MRKH. How common is it in the population to have any of the 40 plus conditions? Well, is it known? so you'll see in the gender debate, the 1.7% is offered as a uh, percentage. There's a few problems with that. First of all, Fausto Sterling, who came up with that number, she fudged the number slightly anyway. Um, secondly, I, I know Kathleen Stock. She wrote that book and she said that technically makes me intersex because I lost an ovary when I was yeah. in my 20s. And she just basically said anyone who's like a little bit different. Like if we'll you put, go bring into them in. that yeah. concept that that technically, okay. and th- th- yeah, so it just messes the whole thing because that's but, not right. But also that 1.7 includes, so I mentioned earlier CAH. So there's two different types of CAH you are born with and then the CAH that occurs later in life. And they included the late onset CAH, which accounts for 1.5%. Now, DSD is supposed to be something you're born with, not something that develops later in life. So if you take those out, you're down to 0.2% of the population. Okay. okay. Then the big word, difference. Big difference. But then <laughs> on top of that, intersex used to mean, it didn't used to mean people like me. It was more about people who had like the mismatch between the chromosomes and their phenotype or... The, the more complex DSDs. If you only include those, it's something like 0.05% oh my of the God. population. So it gets even... So it depends on your criteria, really. Yeah. And there's no medical definition of intersex. So it can be... It can it could be any of those figures, depending on what you're looking at. And what's, what's really annoying is that they take... They sort of describe the 0.05% and then apply it to the 1.7%. So it looks like the complicated cases are they're as common as redheads as they say but of course they're not <laughs> yeah <laughs> so maybe you can you mentioned gender right so obviously you were embroiled at some point in these gender conversations can you maybe let's let's veer there because of course intersex conditions have been kind of co-opted by the gender advocates and i i talk to parents all the time who say my daughter doesn't think that sex is real and she's talking about intersex and she's not intersex. I don't know where this is coming from. So you you have some insider knowledge here. Help us understand how you got embroiled in these debates. Um, intersex in general or myself? <laughs> if I, I can start How with about inter- both? Why don't we start wherever you'd like? So there's a intersex in general. There's a few um, reasons that it's embroiled. Firstly, the surgeries where um, the the real person that pushed for those a long time ago was John Money, who I think most people involved in the gender debate will have come across him at some point or another. And that was about, and his thing was about imposing a gender on a child. So like when we talked about removing the penis of the boy and raising the boy as a girl, obviously they're not imposing a sex because they can't, they were imposing a gender on the child. And that's really where gender identity and the theory started was with him and his work with children with DSDs and the David Reimer case then some trans there's well some trans activists think that if they claim intersex status that gives them some like more legitimacy um there's there's been people who trans activists who've written papers about that sort of trying to persuade other trans people to identify as intersex that seems to be happening in ireland as far as they seem to call it lgbti instead of lgbtq yeah and they very much a lot of it's quite noticeable quite a lot of trans activists are certainly self self kind of self-identifying as intersex 
And who's anybody to say they aren't? And you can't question it because it's yeah. so personal. So you have to sort of go along with it. But you get, um, there's been papers written about this where, um, and it is predominantly trans people, although you get some other people who oddly will try to identify into it, but it's predominantly trans people. And often they have quite fantastical, because they don't really know anything either. So they claim some like fantastical, like DSD that doesn't exist. And then, um, you know, claim that that's, that's them. And what's happened is because they're more willing to talk to the press, let's say, or like the media than people, most people with DSD is very private. Um, so you end up then with the trans activists becoming spokespeople, even though they don't have the DSDs. It's a recognised, it's a genuinely recognised problem. They In the UK, the government did a survey, an LGBT survey, and they included the I for the first time. And at the end of it, they just said the data's meaningless because it's so obvious that so many people are using this, not meaning in a medical sense. So there's, yeah, that's the... Uh, that's why we're in there. I think. I'm dying to know what got you in. Um, so my, I'd been following the, I stumbled across the gender debate actually through the the kids stuff. There's a, an actor called Robert Webb who had tweeted some things, sort of questioning like the mermaid's way of looking at things, and people attacked him. And he's one of the like the most sort of. I, can't, I don't even use the word progressive these days, but I would have thought of him as being like very progressive, very inclusive. And Liberal. people, yeah, people went after him for it. And, and it, just made to me... clarify, Mermaids is a trans organization in the UK that supposedly advocates for trans children, which takes quite a radical position. So it sounds like this gentleman was challenging some of their perspectives and then he got attacked for it. Is yeah. that right? Yeah. Okay. And that just made me sort of... I, I had that, you know, he's been called a bigot and hateful. And I was kind of thinking, I can't imagine this guy is like bigoted or hateful. So I went down the rabbit hole then of like the people he was listening to. And I started to listen to them. And so through that, I found lots of gender critical people on Twitter. And then that made me look more at what trans activists were saying as well. And then the thing that kind of did for me in the end, there's a trans activist in the UK called Munro Bergdorf. And she was saying... Um, women shouldn't talk about their reproductive organs at the Women's March because it's offensive to women who don't have the same reproductive organs. And I was just really offended by, like, if you don't have a... Like, women without wombs don't want to hear you talking about your your wombs. And, like, I don't particularly want to be around womb chat, but then I wouldn't go to a place where that's going to happen. And that doesn't mean I would ever tell other... I have three sisters. They're all... Mm -hmm. They all don't have MRKH. They all have babies. Mm -hmm. They talk about their uteruses. They talk about their pregnancies. (laughs) They talk about their periods. I'm fine. Sometimes I leave the room because I don't have anything to add or it's not a conversation I enjoy. But I would never say, no, you can't talk about that or you can't equate it to being a woman. And Mm. I was really offended by the trans activists trying to say that women like me felt like them. And that's when I then I started my Twitter account and kind of just said, I disagree. And this is like my perspective. And were you thinking, I'm not like a trans woman and I'm being almost asked to be the same as. The same uh, as, yeah. yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, I did some... I, th- there is an article about women with MRK actually um, where they talk to a psychologist who worked with the women and this was like a, written a while ago and where they say one of the things that um, because often women with MRK might have to dilate and do things like that so they could end up in a clinic that trans women are using and then they will have that reaction of like am I like them and it's not you know mm. it's not bigoted or transphobic or, but just kind of is, it, is this who I am it's a question and yeah, and that it's one of the things that will be worked through. Like, no, you're not the same, and this is why Whoa. it's different. Oh my god, I, I hadn't even realized that. That's really profound, actually, because that's kind of exactly what trans activism is trying to imply. That if you are a woman with this condition, what makes you different than a male to female trans woman? I mean, that that's kind of the implication. Yeah. I mean, that is the implication. Which I think is fine to be offended by without it meaning that you you have a negative thought towards trans people. It's just like, that's not me. That's not my story. It's not my experience. It's not who I am. And when did you join? When did you kind of jump in? Sorry, Sasha. It would have been about four or five years ago now, I think. 
because I had my Twitter account that obviously got banned. Um, yeah, let's talk about that because that may not be obvious to everyone. You're not on Twitter anymore. I'm not on Twitter anymore. You, your heyday of Twitter is past. <laughs> yeah. And you, you were the great of our KH voice. Yeah, you were, you were much <laughs> beloved on Twitter. But w- what happened? Why did you get kicked off Twitter? Um, I was never given a reason. They just said, um, they just, they said hateful conduct, which I appealed and asked for like the example of what the hateful conduct was. And then they just changed it to repeated violations of the rules. So I questioned that again and asked what rules I'd repeatedly violated. And then they changed and gave me a different reason. And then they told me if I emailed them again, they wouldn't email me back. So there was no point saying anything else. Well, and that was the a, end to it. A personal question. Is your life so much better now that you're off of Twitter? It genuinely is. Genuinely. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> I miss it. I'm very late to join Twitter. I only joined in 2018, 2019, something like that, 2019. And so uh, I'm going to shout, is it really much better? It's, well, I got to the, because my account was so active and I was tagged into arguments oh, all were, the time. You were, I and tagged I, you. Like, I remember getting to the point of like waking up in the morning and like opening my phone and just that dread of like, what is like, you know... <laughs> <laughs> what am I going to be hit with? And I don't have that anymore, which is... But I miss my Twitter friends. And I, there's times when I see things and I just think, oh, I wish I had an account because I have something to say You were now. so good with words. You were such a <laughs> cracker. You really were. You just were able to, whoa, whack them. Yeah. And so do you, are you still active in this kind of conversation? Because, of course, Twitter is a place where a lot of these debates happen. But are, are there other ways that you're... I know you're blo- you have a blog, but are you still active in these conversations? Well, I do more now with because I work for DSD Families now, which is a charity that supports young people and their family with DSD. Um, and I, so we do a lot of work behind the scenes there, which is actually probably my Twitter account was great for the people that I met and for outreach. But actually, the behind the scenes work's really valuable, and we have managed to make a difference. I don't. I never know how much to say because I'm always worried that trans actors mm. will come along behind us and try and change mm. what we've changed. How could you make a difference? What would you be making a difference? Am I blundering so, like, into the we, secret? No, so, <laughs> so, like, we had these censors in the UK last year and they were looking at the sex and the gender identity questions and we were one of the groups that they consulted with. And we actually got a lot of what we asked for within that, which I think would have come as a surprise, yeah. And then we just get that it's those sort of opportunities where we get to meet with, you know, the proper people, not just shouting at someone on Twitter, but getting to meet with the people making the decisions because we it's just a more of a formal like setting. I'm I'm really curious about something, you know, the cultural changes around these topics have been so fast and so dramatic. And of course, your perspective as a person with an intersex condition and based on your writing and your thinking, obviously you're not in favor of the way trans activism is trying to reframe this. But as you said, it's a a community of people with DSDs with a variety of opinions. So what's the best argument on the other side of the fence to where having a DSD might make somebody, um, I guess, amenable to the argument that maybe sex is a spectrum. I mean, what's the best argument there? Because I don't buy it personally, but I'd like to hear like a good faith. What so is the I. best argument there? I, I don't, I'm probably not the best person trying to argue that <laughs> side. Um, and I think that there, well, there are people with DSD who do struggle with this, seeing themselves as completely male or completely female. Um, some really like the intersex label for that reason. It just feels more comfortable to them. Um, a lot of... <laughs> The sex spectrum is different. A lot of the sex spectrum articles you see being shared in intersex groups and they kind of like it in that like, oh, at last someone's writing about us. Mm. But I don't think they necessarily realise what the end game is with a lot of those articles in that using us to deconstruct sex entirely. I don't think many of them realise that. They just see it as like, oh, finally, like someone's interested. Mm. And then I know the trans activists as well, they often will talk about how there's high rates of dysphoria amongst people with DSD, which is true, I think, which I think is not unexpected necessarily. People who with different bodies can have lots of different feelings. Um, what I find quite curious is that rates of transition are no different to the general population. So we might have high rates of dysphoria, but we're not transitioning. 
Oh. I wonder if that's still true. I wonder if there's been any shifts in the last 10 years around that. Is there any data on it, recent data? Um, no, and it, again, it's intersex data, DSD data is hard to get hold of. Mm-hmm. A lot of what mm-hmm. you find are self-selecting surveys done through LGBTI groups, so it's un- that makes it unreliable. Mm. Um, clinical data, though, that's that's the latest clinical data where they looked at lots of different studies and that's what they came up with was around one percent of people choose to transition as adults with a dsd wow that's a small number yeah Mm -hmm. so they uh, they overrepresent the dysphoria and imply that that means trans and of course it's two different things i wonder if it's because you're more likely i think if you seek help with a dsd to be encouraged towards bodily acceptance rather than like rejection of your body Mm. but i don't know i i'd love to i'd love to see someone do research into that and find out why we recently interviewed Carol Hooven, who recent who wrote a book about testosterone, and she was talking. I think Stella remind me. I think she was talking about CAH, the condition, and yeah. she was saying that females with CAH tend to, on average, have more male typical interests and jobs, and be more likely to be a lesbian, and also have uh, some more masculine kind of traits. Is that accurate, Claire? I mean, before yeah, I go on, that's. Um, the research would certainly back that up, yeah. Okay. So, I mean, to me, the way I think about gender dysphoria is, like, if you are a, a female person with those traits, even though you're not necessarily going to have gender dysphoria, I can understand why you would feel slightly at odds with your role in women's life. I mean, if if you haven't really taken a deliberate stance against gender categories i could understand how that type of experience might make someone prone to dysphoria yeah definitely and i think in general um i know like i with my and i don't my body isn't over masculinized i don't produce excess testosterone but i know like i've joked with i've joked with my friends in the past about where i fit in especially as like as i've got older and my peers have had babies and then and i'm still out drinking because with my friends because like i haven't had the baby so i don't have to be at home and kind of we've joked about like where i fit in with the boys and the girls as i've got older and again like i think like that could make you feel quite dysphoric if you weren't comfortable with it it's i it's, mm-hmm. it's always been funny to me but i i guess mm-hmm. not to everyone mm-hmm. what's your position about um like I, I know I saw it in Helen Joyce's book that there's an overrepresentation of of women with with DSDs in sport. I I I, we, I want to qualify this. We don't really know, but it seems to be. Is that right? It's yeah. There's often a, a quote of like quite a high number of X Y women in women's sport. I think there could be several reasons. I've I have thought about this, and I think there could be several reasons for it. Um, I don't think it's necessarily. I, if we talked about Castor Semenya, let's say, so Castor has a DSD called 5-alpha reductase deficiency, which means that's a really complicated one to explain. So it's to do with um, a, def- a deficiency in a certain like type of testosterone. And when someone is born with 5-ARD, they can have like, they can be born with a range of and they can be born male or female with 5 They could be born with a female um, phenotype or a male phenotype or a slightly more ambiguous phenotype. So where there would be further investigations. But you could be born looking with a female phenotype and there could be no questions asked. You, with 5ARD, you have XY chromosomes and testes. For someone like Castor, the testes would be internal. Then what happens is at puberty, they start producing this testosterone and are able to respond to it so their body will masculinize. And that can, again, that can be varied in results. That can mean there's a a famous thing called the Guevidochis in uh, the Dominican Republic because 5ARD is very prevalent there. It's uh, it's genetically inherited. So you would get, you can get with like a bottleneck where you get lots of people in the same place with it. I've noticed that. I've seen writing about that, that actually it can be very location specific. Yeah. Certain so DSDs. Yeah. In the Dominican Republic, they have this in Guevidochis, which means, I think it means balls at 12. And uh, so basically what happens is the testosterone um, begins to impact their body and their penis will then grow 
later in later in life and their testicles will drop and they will look male that doesn't happen to everyone with 5ARD that but that's one possible which again if you think about feeling dysphoric I can imagine that would induce a lot of very complicated feelings but but are people born with 5ARD always like biologically female are these, is this a condition that affects only female people it affects male people as okay, in genetically male so xy chromosomes okay. they would all have okay. xy chromosomes okay. and can it affect female not that i know of i haven't heard of it being so, anyone with xx chromosomes i think am, it would am be i XY. right then in saying so castra semenya is is technically male if if is she the is, way that this would be phrased in dsd terminology would be yeah. that she uh is genetically male or she has male chromosomes I didn't know that. I, I did. thought Castor Semenya was a female person with higher levels of testosterone for some reason. No, so she has XY chromosomes and internal testes, which I makes would... her very interesting as a case. Incredibly complicated as a case, yeah. as far as I and can And you get. can see why someone like that may have an athletic advantage, because obviously there's the testosterone there doing its job. Um, but I think, but not all DSDs and not all XY DSDs would have a similar ad- Could advantage. Could I ask, would would most people, male, let's say, who are born with 5A or D, would most of them be brought up as female? Because I gather Castor was brought up as female and then puberty de- would have kicked in. It would depend on the genitals she was born with. So... And I've seen her parents. I've seen her parents say, you know, I changed her diaper, so I know she was female. So I assume that Castor was born with typical female-looking genitals. And there were also stories from when she was older, and they began to question Castor's sex, and she would have to show her genitals to be able to compete when she was a teenager. So she must have had typically female looking genitalia i can only assume because no one really this, thought to this question is where she got much older female sports seems to be in a really when i read helen joyce's book about the female sports i just thought oh oh well we haven't a clue now because at first they <laughs> did it by the visuals of the female genital and then they tried the hormone levels or no then they tried the chromosomes but they couldn't say it was as simple as xx and xy because it's not and then they moved on to testosterone levels which is up where i think they are now i'm talking about the olympic committee mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and all three as as tests don't really encompass dsds appropriately yeah. So well, the rule now is actually, they say it's testosterone, but it's testosterone plus chromosomes now. So um, women with CAH who have the excess testosterone, XX chromosomes and ovaries and excess testosterone, the rules, the rules don't cover them. They don't have to change their testosterone. It's XY women with internal testes who can respond to testosterone. So, for example, C oh, okay. case women wouldn't be included in the rules either because they're not responding to the testosterone. So wow. is it, it getting better be then? Are, are they kind of improved? It's difficult to say. Yeah. <laughs> it's really and especially at the moment because it's so the intersex sport stuff is so involved with the transport stuff. So it's very difficult to say how it's going and how effective it is. Um it's really, it's just, it's so contentious at the moment. It's a shame because you, D, women with DSD aren't going to get a fair sort of trial as long as they're it's like the Trojan horse for the trans athletes. And have you got or have DSD families or DSD kind of organisations, have they got a solution? Because when I read the sports issue with DSDs, I just thought, well, that's not, that's a too difficult chest problem for yeah. me like we've with dsd families we've kind of not waded into it too much it's difficult for us as well because what are we going to because the, we're talking about children and what we're not going to say that girls with a dsd have to go into the boys pe lesson because that's like not going to be practical so it's it's not like it's not something we've really um it's curious that I, I know they were looking at like there's a podium where they suspect all three women had a DSD and it is curious and maybe there are questions to ask about fairness and we're open to like a discussion but it would have to be about DSDs and not be about trans inclusion as well. What about the psychological aspect of this experience of having a DSD? I mean, of course, you can probably speak 
from your personal experience and also as a person who works for DSD families, you've probably met lots of young people with these experiences. What is this like? What are some common experiences around growing up and the body? And can you just share some more about that? It can be, a diagnosis can be quite traumatic for the whole family, um, especially later in life. I know like my parents found my diagnosis really difficult because we I was 18 by the time I was finally diagnosed. And that's quite, you know, I'd, we'd spent 18 years assuming I would just, like my sisters have done, sort of go on and have my own babies and that, that would be my life. And um, and obviously that wasn't to be. So it it's like... Um, my mum and I sort of talked about it like it's like a grieving process that you go through. You kind of have to like put that, you know, let that go and then work out, well, what are, what is, what is life going to look like instead? I think that's quite typical for a lot of people when they get their diagnosis. Um, it is recommended when, um, when they notice a the baby with a DSD in the hospital that there should be a psychologist or psychiatrist as part of like the multidisciplinary team who's there to support the parents through through it um but that's not is that's not me that's not, um, <laughs> do you hear that yeah like <laughs> okay a, that's but that doesn't always happen unfortunately um psychological support is quite woeful it's one of the things that dsd families that we campaign for all the time is better psychological support because most people need it uh, on some on some level to come to terms with their dsd and to- talking about the kind of the needs of the community, is intersex considered a throwback word and is DSDs a kind of accepted phrase or I'm still uneasy because I find when I say DSDs, people don't know what I'm talking about if I say it. It's tricky. Um, intersex is the word most people know, but it's not the word most people with DSDs use. Mm. It's a lot of people with DSDs don't use it. I know at DSD families, we've heard of children having panic attacks when the words apply to them because they don't like the connotations. And, and uh, more and more, as it's more confused with other issues, people don't like it because, like, I didn't, I was in my 30s before I knew that word ever was meant to apply to me. And for, if you had asked me for years, I would have said, no, that's not, that's not me because I would have looked at intersex activists and thought, I'm not like them. That's not, um, that's not who I am. And I don't have, like, the problems that they're talking about. Um, DSD is contentious mainly because it used to stand for disorder and a lot of people don't want to be labelled as disordered. Um, all the time we're looking at new, <laughs> like a new umbrella term that everyone will accept. Uh, there, there isn't one at the moment. Um, who knows what we'll come up with. But DSD is the... Certainly in the UK and the US, it's that's like the medical umbrella term. So most people with a DSD would have come across the term DSD more likely than come across the term intersex, unless they're sort of politically engaged, then they might. So when like you were 25 term. or 30 and you saw the word intersex, you thought it had nothing to do with you? Nothing to do with me, yeah, absolutely nothing to do with me. And especially with like the LGBTI as that increased so kind of why would that be I'm what they would call cis het, you know so why would that why why would I be there mm-hmm. so yeah nothing nothing to do with me at all I do I remember saying even when I started my Twitter account and I was tweeting about having MRKH and people kept coming to me with intersex questions I was like why are you asking me <laughs> it wasn't until I started researching then I was like oh now I know why that, oh because like MRKH is countered in the 1.7. It's uh, and when you were told at 18 you have a condition called MRKH, nobody said the word intersex. No, but then they, to be honest, they didn't tell me it was called MRKH either. Which what is did not, they say? They just told me I didn't have a fully developed uterus and I didn't have a cervix and I wouldn't have children. And then they sent me home. And that was, <gasps> that they was didn't there. say, "Oh, we know what this is. Like, no, here's the information." No. And oh we didn't know God. to ask, you know, we didn't know that they right. might have a... I just thought it was an unfortunate thing that had happened to me and only me, you know, kind of. Finding out I had a name was really important because then it was like, oh, there are, if they've named it, there are others. It was such like a, a really important like moment for me. When did you find out it had a name? Uh, in my late 20s, early 30s. Oh, you were 10 years. Yeah, just sort of like, I'm just like, you know. I'm the only one in the world. The, yeah. oh. oh my gosh. I'm I'm like totally shocked by that. 
Was that a rough, I mean, was that a rough time those years before you had any concrete information or did you just think weird gamble of the die or roll of the die? Here I am. Yeah, I just, I, I, I think I'm quite fortunate. I went to a primary school that had a lot of children with, um, it was a mainstream school, but we had a lot of children with, um, disabilities, physical disabilities, which included children with rare genetic conditions and things. And I think I was just kind of like, well, I'm just like one of them in a way, you know, kind of like they, some of those have got a thing that's only them. And that's just like me as well. So I think like that's how I sort of rationalized it in my mind. Yeah. And how did you end up discovering that there was a name for your condition? Someone had asked me why I had, I was married at that point. And someone asked me why I didn't have children and I tried to explain and they was, and they were sort of saying, well, what's it called? It must have a name. And I was saying, oh, it doesn't have a name. And you like, said, I never thought of that. <laughs> yeah, and they were like, it must have a name. You can't just, like, it can't just be, a, like, these things have a name. And then that made me, like, go and Google. And I just Googled everything I knew and then found MRK. And was like, oh, this, is, this is me. This is what I have. What did you feel at the, at the time? Were you, uh, what was that like? I remember being, like, slightly upset that I hadn't been told it had a name so I hadn't been able to go and find other people um but then as I say also just that thing of like oh there are others like it was it was a really nice even though like I didn't I hadn't met another person or I wasn't talking yeah just it was quite a nice moment and how soon did you meet somebody with that condition I've never met anyone in person with it but I've talked to people online no no oh but I've met people online and talked to them, which is the, in itself is just uh, just being able to say to someone else like, oh, like you didn't have your period too. What was that like? Was is a really nice like a thing to have, like a bonding thing. Oh my god! So you've never met one mm-hmm. in five thousand. I suppose I can see why you'd never meet somebody. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I just yeah. presumed you would meet in organisations if you follow me. They do have like I have discovered there are MRKH groups and they do real world meetups, but I don't know. They, I've spoken to someone who went to one, and she said there was a lot of sort of standing around and and crying which I get people are processing like their their grief and how they feel but I don't know if that would be right for me I don't think I think I would feel really uncomfortable with that Mm. um so yeah it's kind of that's fascinating sorry (laughs) well I mean what what comes up for me is just that people experience the limitations of their bodies differently. And it sounds like for you, you had to come to terms with the fact that like, for me, having children is not going to be part of my path. I have to make meaning in other ways. And that's how one must move forward from any kind of like biological limitation. And it's just interesting to hear that I guess for some people maybe depending on their temperament and how they were thinking about things or how late they got their diagnosis maybe just coming to terms with that is really really challenging until until I met you I thought it was really quite simple that men were xy and women were xx and yeah there was there was something called intersex but it was kind of immaterial but I didn't realize like so am I right in thinking some women can have Y chromosomes. Yeah. 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 And so and when people some just, men can have, some men don't have a Y chromosome. So people are being incorrect when they say, well, they have a Y chromosome. That That's an irrelevant sentence, really. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's it's one simple. of the things that makes them, um, I think it, it's what makes the gender debate quite difficult because they're people on both sides are very certain of what they know. And in the end, and it's a complicated subject, I just, you know, mm-hmm. it's, uh, but it, it does end up being like both sides, I think, can be quite exclusionary in, yeah. a, in a way with DSD yeah. because of the way that they try to make, they want such a solid answer. So my brain is doing this devil's advocate thing. It's really torture. I do this to myself all the time. I, I'm <laughs> always having no. opposite. <laughs> yeah. So, so here's, here's where I'm going. Just bear with me. If some males don't have a Y chromosome, they're XX, presumably they also have some male genitalia, otherwise they wouldn't have been identified as males. 
So in that case, we're going to argue that a penis makes the man, just hypothetically. But then, then there are some people who are genetically, biologically, let's say female, with a genitals that look like a penis. But we're trying to say in those cases that they're still women. So the interesting question... Can I ask, are they genitals that look like a penis as opposed to they are a penis? Actually a penis, yeah. Well, I mean, I guess this is what's so freaking confusing. <laughs> and to be fair, I've also been... I've also seen in kind of like biology textbooks for children in fetal development, the differentiation between sex organs, you know, one goes this way and one goes the other. So the creation of a vagina versus the creation of a penis, they start with similar roots and then they differentiate to some degree. So like, this is really throwing me for a loop because it, it's not super straightforward as to like what qualities are we going to agree on that constitute what makes somebody a man a man with a dsd versus being a woman like what is the is there some kind of agreed upon definition amongst the dsd orgs that say well here's how we Here's why we call this person a woman with a DSD rather than calling this person a man. That's my question. Yes, mine too. <laughs> I, I don't know that there is like a definitive answer to that. DSD oh. families have a... <laughs> oh, oh, I know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> DSD families have a really good resource that looks at... Um, it's mainly development of the phenotype, so what we look like externally. Okay. And the story of that. Yeah, it's what okay. we look like externally. Um, and I think most intersex or DSD organizations would probably agree with that in the end it's, it is what we look like externally that, wow. because that is how bodies are classified when you say that oh, you're talking about the genitals yeah yeah okay so then that kind of brings us back to the gender the critical penis argument makes the man. <laughs> <laughs> right that sex is observed at birth yeah so in cases where around puberty is when some internal testicles drop is that person still considered female? I think that becomes like a personal question at that point. So like in like if we go back to the Dominican Republic and the Guavidoches, in the Dominican Republic, the Guavidoches, it's perfect because there's more of them as well. Okay. So it's it's not normal because it's still relatively rare, but it's more prevalent. So you could then so it's quite common for people who have been raised as girls once the testosterone kicks in and their penis grows and their balls drop for them then to say I'm a boy now and I will be a boy in society but where where you live in a society where that's more common that's mm -hmm. probably easier to do here um what often will tend to happen if someone's been raised a girl is they will opt to have their testes removed at that point to stop any further virilization that so might happen today remain. to a girl in in Ireland is that oh, right? It, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's five ARD is extremely rare in outside of places where it's genetically more prevalent, mm, mm -hmm. but that could happen. So that the girl might say, "I will have my testes removed because I want to, I am a girl," and so that's how I would choose to. Stella, what's hap play. what's happening in Ireland with this? Oh, I don't know. I think it's very very rare. And I oh, do, okay. I, you know what I mean. So I'm just saying. So that could happen. So that actually oh, people could be born male mm. and. Um, be, be raised as female because it's just culturally inappropriate. But can I ask? But also know, because they look female, so they're not. Um, they look because female they would be until born with a female 12. Phenotype, until twelve, yeah, and then they would. testosterone kicks in. And yeah. can I ask? I don't want to obsess about Castor, but Castor is so famous and has caused so much. I think so much. I don't know. Nobody really knows where to land here because it's so complicated. So I'm really glad we're talking about it. I think everybody will have to have a lie down after this episode. <laughs> <laughs> but can I ask about um, Castor? Is Castor from an area where it is common so that therefore it was kind of a common scenario? Not as far as I know. I don't think it's particularly common in South Africa. It tends to be like the Dominican Republic is because it's an island. So you ended up with a, a lot of people okay. there and a lot of not necessarily interbreeding within families, but, you know, you end up mm -hmm, with that, that mm -hmm. bottleneck. As mm -hmm. far as I know, it's not that common in South Africa. But, and I, I assume Castor just looked typically female. But, I mean, we don't know. Mm -hmm. But I assume she just looked typically female. And, and we don't know 
what happened to her body in puberty either it the, the, the penis growing and the balls dropping is mm. one option but that doesn't mean she may just have got slightly more masculine looking yeah which she she obviously you can see the testosterone has had an effect on how she looks without mm. meaning i know a lot of people say that it's racist to say she looks masculinized but i think that ignores her dsd and it's not mm. saying that like all women who are all black athletes look uh, masculinized mm-hmm. caster mm-hmm. particularly mm-hmm. does because she has mm-hmm. this D- dsd oh boy you know i mean even though i i don't agree with it i really understand how theoretically there is this slippery slope where one can say it's up to me how I choose to identify my sex. Because in the cases of people with DSDs, when there is this ambiguity, it really is up to the person how they want to define their sex. Now, this is different from gender. Gender identity is a totally different thing. But I can see how this uh, argument would be so tempting for trans advocates to jump on. Yeah, in fairness, so can I. Yeah, and, and it's it's really complicated, um, but it's also so unfair to people with DSDs. I actually wanted to read something that you wrote, if that's okay, Claire. You wrote back in 2019 about the Maya Forstadter case. And Maya Forstadter was a tax expert whose contract wasn't renewed at her job because she had made some gender-critical tweets And she brought the case to the UK Employment Tribunal and lost in 2019. Since then, of course, she has appealed and won. But the judge during the first tribunal said that, in his argument, was trying to say that people with Turner syndrome are not really male and not really female, and that we kind of have to act like sex is mutable in order to respect the dignity of trans people. And you wrote something on dignity, which I found really beautiful. You said... The fact is, people with DSDs have been stripped of their dignity, their right to be told the truth about their bodies and their sex, to have accurate information about their medical conditions and development. This is our history. It shouldn't be our present and our future. It was what we wanted to end, but it's now written down in a legal document in the UK, and this is how the world should be. And to counter this is allegedly anti-science and undignified for trans people. And I just thought, wow. I mean, to talk about dignity in that UK ruling that way by the judge and to be willing to take the the stories of people with DSDs and just throw them under the bus was so mind-blowing. And I really loved what you wrote about that. I remember reading your essay many times around that time. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah, it's really powerful. Really powerful. It's it, it was it was it's been such a kind of eye opener when I got to know you, Claire, and hearing you talk about it because I thought it was simple. And I think people try to pretend it's simple. And it's it's so far from simple. So once the word DSD comes up, I just kind of my eyes open and my mouth shuts because I'm like, okay, <laughs> now I have to listen. <laughs> because I really think this is not uh, it's not a subject people should talk about loosely. Did you read um, either Helen Joyce's book or Carol Hooven's book on testosterone? Books? I haven't, no, but I want to read both of them. They're both on my list of books to read. <laughs> both of them, I think, write brilliantly, but what would I know? So I think they both write brilliantly on that issue. It's a really thorny issue. Is it getting I think more that, out there, do you think? Um, I don't know. I'm... I've seen a few more people. I'm in some intersex groups on Facebook and I've seen more people kind of beginning to question this. Like, why are we always being brought up by trans people? Why is Mm -hmm. this happening? And I think the more people notice that, the more pushback there'll be. Because really it shouldn't, it has no place in the debate about trans people. Could you tell me why? Like, could could you succinctly just explain why does your DSDs have no place in the trans debate? Because it's no more common amongst trans people than it is amongst non-trans people. It's not the reason that they're trans. It doesn't, and I don't, deconstructing sex does nothing to further gender. You know, it's the the two are not the same thing. Um, And yeah, just we're a completely different demographic. We're not people with psychological issues or issues around culture and society and gender. We're people with physical differences in our body. And the more we're used 
and co-opt her to for the gender narrative the less our needs are met because people begin to believe that by doing lgbti they're doing intersex work and can you, can you, I remember you once said something, sorry to jump in, but it's so important. You said to me, and when they co-opt the I into that acronym, the funding that would be going for us, which is a very underfunded kind of um, issue, it's not going towards people no. with DSTs. They did a study a few years ago where they worked out that 1% of global LGBTI funding is allocated to intersex, <gasps> so just 1% of the funding. Oh and my gosh. what happens is a lot of LGBTI groups will claim that funding and channel it into third gender and those and sex is a spectrum and those kind of things, yeah. And away from, so like I was saying earlier, we need better psychological support for people with diagnosis. The funding isn't there to do that because the money is going to other issues instead. And it's funny because... Uh, they're trying to blur the lines between s- the sexes, claiming that that will help loosen up gender roles, but in fact, it does the opposite. And in your piece there about dignity, you talked about the dignity of, of people with these conditions requiring that they're told the truth about their bodies. So it's it's completely counterproductive to try and blur the lines around sex because then you can't have factual information about your body. Yeah. Well, they used to use words like hermaphrodite in medical in your, like medical notes, and it was a way of obscuring. So rather than giving someone a proper diagnosis, they would use a label like hermaphrodite, and it was a way to obscure the reality of someone's diagnosis and the reality of their body which also paved the way for surgeries because you didn't people didn't have the information that they needed to say I don't need that surgery or um, you know I can maybe wait so I the sex spectrum I think just does a similar job to like labels like hermaphrodite it just makes everything blurry and it doesn't give people the complete picture that they should have my understanding, I just want to clarify this point because there was a, a colleague of mine who has an intersex condition who's also transgender who who used the terms himself hermaphroditism. And I think he was referring to something called ovotesticular disorder. So why you're you're saying that 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 hermaphroditism isn't really an accurate classification. Obviously some people can use it for themselves, but can you just help me understand that? Because I know that I had gotten in this conversation a while back. So it did used to be given as a medical diagnosis. It would be written in someone's note that they were hermaphrodite. So there are some people who will have that terminology and that's the only terminology they have. Um, it's not accurate because there are no human hermaphrodites. People can have a mixture of ovarian and testicular tissue, but they can't mm-hmm. produce both sperm and ova, which okay. is what's okay. required to be hermaphrodite. Got it. So that's, yeah. That's the mm. difference. But I wouldn't, it's that there are people with DSD who will use that word because that's the word that was given to them and that's the word that, that they're comfortable with. And we're, we're coming up toward the end. Is there any, any words you'd say to somebody who, who has a DSD or, or who has a child with a DSD? Is there anything that you tend to like to kind of get out to them? Oh, I don't know. That's a really good question. I think just that it will be okay, you know, it will be okay. Mm. And I think that's the main Mm. thing that people need to hear. And it might not feel like it's okay at the moment. And there'll be times, various times where it might, like I came to terms with 18 and then when I was older, my friends started having babies. It was not okay again for a little while, but Mm -hmm. you know, it will be okay. There's always a, there's always a way, isn't there, you know? Well, Claire, it was so great to speak with you. Thank you for uh, sharing your time with us and your wisdom. Um, and yeah, we, we really appreciate having you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I really enjoyed it. It's it was great. really interesting. <laughs> really interesting. Thank you. Thanks for joining us this week on Gender, A Wider Lens. This podcast is partially sponsored by Rhyme, Rethink Identity Medicine Ethics. RIME is a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the long term care for gender variant individuals. Visit rethinkime.org to learn more. If you found value in our show, please review us on iTunes and subscribe so you never miss an episode. And you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. 
just go to our link tree. That's linktr.ee slash wider lens pod. Our discussions are for educational purposes only and are not intended as a substitute for mental health services. 